Can you all hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for being with us again. We are very excited to be back after a week to virtually catch up as we traditionally do in normal circumstances every Thursday evening at the club. Dedicated to this magical art of photography, we are all so passionate about. The president of the Malta Photographic Society and myself are working closely, scouting various photo artists to complete our initial program of 2021, which will take us till end March. Till end March. We are nearing completion of this webinar calendar, which comprises established photo artists coming locally and also from abroad. We are also trying to set up a webinar with a difference with an established local photo studio based on an innovative concept. However, more details on this will be revealed once this is finalized. Some short notices, as I usually uh, give in, in my introduction. The next photo shoot with models organized by Nellas Photography will be on Sunday, 7 February. The chosen theme is Valentine's, where all models will, will be providing their own props and also make over. A promo will be circulated in the Malta Photography Webinars group as soon as the exact time and location are published. These shoots carry a budget fee of just 10 euros and each participating photographer will get the opportunity to work alone with different models. These photo shoots are organized, are all organized in conformity with the stipulated health measures. Namely, all photographers will need to wear a mask throughout the shoot and observe the social distance principle. Our webinar today will focus on, a fine, on fine art landscapes and long exposure photography. Mr. Theodor Kafopoulos, ex excuse me if I got that wrong, <laughs> hailing from Alexandria, Greece, kindly accepted our invitation to share with us some of his knowledge and excellent works in this interesting topic of photography. The Malta photography webinars uh, sorry, sorry. Mr. Kefalopoulos is a self-taught fine art photographer and tutor based in Alexandria, Greece. Starting in 2013 and focusing on black and white foreign art photography since 2016, he considers this art to be a form of profound expression, a creative process that leads to alternative views on ordinary subjects. His activities include participation in international photo exhibitions, creation of fine art books and prints, and a representation by two fine art galleries in Greece and the United States. He also runs group and private courses on location and online, and his works have been featured through numerous interviews and presentations. He is a member of the Royal Photographic Society with an associate distinction. A couple of thanks, as usual. I thank Stephen Buhajar for the tremendous support he gives me to put up these webinars. Yosef Mifsud, our technical guru, for streaming our webinars live on the MPS Facebook page. The Malta Photographic Society Exco for their ongoing support and also the Facebook groups for supporting us by promoting our webinars on their pages, namely by surname order, Tony Azzopardi from Photography Bain El Habib, Johan De Bono from All Photography, Alexander Kutayar from Photography Shots. I will now hand over the word to the president of the Malta Photographic Society, Stephen Buhajar, to share with us some news regarding the society. So over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Vince. <laughs> and I uh, would like to say good evening, fellow members of the Motor Photographic Society. Thanks once again for joining us for today's uh, webinar. I have been following um, uh, Theodore um, for these past months. And I must say that his photography inspires me because uh, like Theodore, I'm a great fan to black and white, landscapes, architecture, 
and lately to minimalism. Theodore has been to Malta a few months ago, where he came over to explore our islands and capture various landmarks through his lens, as he was saying just before we started this webinar. Theodore, shall you decide to come over once again? <clears throat> I am publicly inviting you to visit our club and maybe hold <clears throat> a short practical course with those members who opt to join one of the courses you may organize. I know that you organize various courses, even um, abroad and also in, 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 uh, <clears throat> in Greece. Anyone who would like to join um, his courses, even online, can do so because we promote um, uh, courses and, and uh, products presented by um, our, our artists, uh, from the invited artists. <clears throat> During this week, we had a couple of members who joined our society and others who renewed their membership online. Thanks a lot. May I remind you and that those who still didn't update their membership to kindly do so by doing by going online or use the traditional method by sending a check payable to the Malta Photographic Society and send it to 137 Old Baker Street, Valletta. Your cooperation and support are highly supported. Since last week's webinar was appealed by many and received positive feedback, for the coming weeks, the Malta Photographic Society, together with Mr. Vince Piscopo, have included another date to hold one more photo clinic session. So please prepare one photo and send it either to me on chairman at mpsmalta.com or to Mr. Vince Piscopo on photoscopomalta at gmail.com. It will help us to better organize the session and try to include most of the works you wish to receive feedback on. These sessions are sought by new upcoming photographers to test their waters in the field they wish to prospect. It is also a good test for those who have been into the field for these past years, but are experimenting with new techniques or are developing new artistic execution. I don't want to take more of Theodore's time as most of you are here to listen to what he has to prepare to us. I leave the floor and invite Mr. Kefalopoulos to start his presentation. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, I will open Theodore's mic. Just, um, uh, I would like to um, uh, inform everyone that anyone who has any questions may write to me on the chat and I will coordinate with Theodore accordingly. Obviously, um, we can interact so that we will have um, also uh, um, uh, a discussion. So if you want to, to ask Theodore, any questions as he's going along, feel free to do so. And I will, even if you want to speak, I will open your mics accordingly. Without further ado, we pass the floor over to you, Theodore. Uh, good luck. So, uh, thank you, Vince. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Stephen for inviting me to this uh, webinar and uh, to all these uh, people that I see that are uh, very uh, passionate about photographers, about photography. It's uh, very good to see an organized group of people uh, in a single society. And uh, of course, I hope to visit your island uh, once again uh, shortly. Um, and why not? We will uh, make a small group and uh, do some demonstration of what I'm, how I'm doing my photography and talk about this stuff in person. So um, I was thinking of, uh, first of all, talking about some things about um, my uh, position with this uh, photographic genre. Uh, along, I will show you, uh, in order to not get bored, I will show you some uh, of my images as a, a slideshow. And then the second part, I will present some of my images that I think that are crucial to, to display uh, the way I visualize an image and uh, how I'm thinking about the subject and before making the capture. And of course, in the end, uh, I will be glad to answer to any, any questions that you might have. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good to answer some questions. So uh, let's start. Um, of course, uh, Stephen has made and uh, uh, Vince also some uh, presentation about me. Uh, so let's... Um, I will show you some of my images along with, as I speak. 
So uh, I started, uh, as uh, Vince said, uh, around 2013. Uh, at, at first, uh, for me, photography was uh, uh, more like a hobby and uh, not a daily activity. And uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, various locations in Greece. And I always carried the bridge camera with me. So I had the opportunity to, uh, first of all, deal with landscapes uh, mostly. And uh, soon after, about six months after I started shooting, I thought of putting um, uh, a more personalized view on the landscapes, uh, like uh, doing close-ups or selecting some uh, unconventional shooting angles uh, regarding uh, landscapes. And uh, as time went by, I, I uh, realized that there was something wrong with my images and what was wrong was the presence of color. And uh, I decided to choose a different route. Uh, and this uh, was combined with my need to, to create some alternative environments. You see, uh, since my childhood, I was fascinated by moody atmospheres uh, and uh, strange environments. And I was rooting for them everywhere, in films, literature, poetry, uh, music also. And uh, for the first time, I realized that I could actually create some uh, atmospheres or, and scenes of my own through photography. So uh, what I did was uh, I decided to abandon color and I also decided to abandon a, a descriptive type of photography. I mean, it, it wasn't just about uh, removing color from actual scenes. It was also about uh, turning them to a new environment, to a new scene, but still um, these uh, new uh, images had a, a strong connection with the initial capture. Uh, I'm not that uh, fond of uh, heavily manipulating an image, uh, for me, doing composites is uh, against my philosophy on fine art photography because uh, many people think that when we speak about fine art photography, what they have in mind is that you take something from its original spot and uh, uh, you completely uh, dismantle it and create something completely new, but it's not always like that. I mean, sometimes uh, I, my photography is about uh, uh, a study on forms or shapes. Sometimes uh, it's uh, about uh, a very interesting cast light on certain surfaces. Uh, so it's not always about uh, heavily manipulating an image. Um, I find that uh, working in black and white uh, gives very interesting results because we are allowed and we are invited to see uh, our world in a comp completely different perspective. And uh, within uh, with this thought process, we realize that uh, many subjects and many objects and constructions, like this one, that these are uh, fishing nets, uh, they become very interesting to see and they can become a work of art. It's true that uh, fine art photography has a long way uh, to reach uh, the, the level of acceptance uh, as paintings do regarding uh, fine art or as sculptures do. Uh, but I think we are close enough to uh, say that uh, photography, fine art photography can be equally perceived as a work of art compared to a painting or compared to a sculpture and stuff like that. Um, this is one of your spots, probably my favorite one. Okay, and um, I'd like to say that uh, when I'm shooting, uh, I have also uh, a tendency to put titles on my works, and uh, I find this to uh, actually make an image complete. I never uh, omit putting titles on my works. Some people think otherwise. I think there is a school of thought that says, uh, don't put titles on your work because this manipulates an image in a, in a wrong way because you are uh, biasing the, uh, how people perceive your image. But I think it's easy for people to just uh, forget about the title and think one of their own. Uh, for me, the title is just a way to express in a, one word 
or a few words um, what I'm thinking when I'm shooting, uh, the impressions that are born in my mind when I'm seeing a subject. Uh, sometimes it's about shapes, such a, sometimes it's about uh, more uh, emotional uh, things like loneliness, like solitude, like uh, uh, a faint remembrance of, of things of the past. Uh, sometimes it's more sophisticated, it's about just, just a building that has interesting shapes and an interesting way that light hits the surfaces, the facade of the, of the buildings. And um, so there is uh, no wrong, there is no right. And according to this perspective, I also uh, uh, follow the photographic rules that we all know, uh, only when, it's, when they, I should follow them. It's not mandatory for me to follow the rule of thirds or some more exotic th rules like uh, the golden ratio uh, or other things like uh, always put a foreground element in front of your of your subject and stuff like that and um, so uh, i think this in a way uh, is about speaking about myself okay and uh, of course uh, we all need to to follow rules just to have them in mind sometimes they work sometimes they don't uh, many people talk about placing uh, your Hello, iPad 2, can you hear me? Can you hear me, iPad 2, please? Flora? Yes, I can. Hi, Vince. Okay, hello, Sorry. hello. Sorry, because <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're checking um, uh, the people ta, who's, who's in the... In, in in the chat because of the the artist told us that he wanted certain people I, I, that's why I, I i wanted to talk to you before but you've joined no, no problem no and i'm i'm sorry i'm late but i had no worries, no worries. Had Laura. A, you, you were up. last week here oh pardon you were last week here as well uh, yes 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 yes, yes okay yes. okay all right flora thank you thank sorry you. about that but we're checking no a bit because <laughs> We, we, we're checking the audience, that that's why. It's okay. I'll, I'm going to put you through the webinar now, in a minute. Thank you. Uh, uh, check the shooting angles, check the level of the camera, uh, decide what is best and what is not. Uh, think about uh, the flow of the water, which is crucial in long exposure photography, of course. Uh, think about the direction of the of light, and uh, so, like many other people, I made mistakes when I started with fine art photography. But soon after, I learned uh, uh, by uh, doing these things again and again uh, how I should uh, prepare for the shot, take my time, uh, think strongly upon a subject, and have an almost finished work in my mind when I was making the capture. And uh, I also uh, like to say a few things about equipment. Uh, of course, uh, we are all photographers. We all know that uh, uh, the best equipment doesn't always bring the best results regarding an image, a finished image. Uh, first of all, it's uh, the, our mind and our uh, passion and our heart behind the capture. And uh, if we practice, uh, we can... Uh, uh, we, we can uh, make some uh, great things even with the basic equipment. But of course, uh, when our photography has some demanding uh, uh, specifications like fine art photography and long exposure photography in specific, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there are strong demands regarding noise levels, regarding sharpness, regarding dynamic range of the sensor, stuff like that. Uh, you have, of course, to choose your equipment carefully and accordingly. Um, I am pretty minimal regarding my equipment. Keith Alul has seen that I only carry a couple of lenses with me. Uh, I'm not that uh, fond of uh, carrying uh, 
a whole bag of lenses. Uh, first of all, because uh, technically uh, we are uh, standing in certain points uh, where it's, uh, we are unable to, uh, to move forth or back. So uh, eventually we have to select uh, uh, some good zoom lenses to do uh, the capture, to make the captures. And uh, second, uh, usually the environment uh, that I'm in when I'm shooting is not that friendly for the sensor. I mean, it's a lot of salty air, uh, lots of humidity, and uh, I prefer to use uh, a good uh, pair of uh, zoom lenses, quality zoom lenses, in order to not uh, let the sensor be exposed to unfriendly uh, weather conditions. I have uh, only a couple of lenses, uh, 24 to 70 and uh, 70 to 200, just two, two lenses. And I would say that 95% of my shots are taken with the 24 to 70 lens, the mid zoom, the classic one. I recently I uh, purchased the uh, 16 to 25 lens because I started working with uh, architectural images. So these require a wider uh, angle and uh, Hopefully, I will visit some spots uh, throughout Europe that uh, they have uh, marked and, uh, after this pandemic is uh, finished. And uh, I will put to use this lens also. Uh, but mostly, so, uh, only one lens that I use. 95% of my shots is with just one lens. Of course, a very sturdy tripod is required and, and uh, a very good uh, tripod head. And uh, believe it or not, I have always with me some other accessories that are really, really crucial to some shots like wellies or an umbrella. Uh, <laughs> Keith is smiling because he saw me using the umbrella <laughs> at the shots. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it happens sometimes that um, uh, it's rainy or it's, uh, the, the, the sun comes up and you need to cover the lens in different ways uh, than uh, uh, just forgetting about the shot. And I also use a, a three ND filters that are quite strong, 10, 11, uh, 10 uh, 12, and 13 stops. Uh, and that's it. Uh, you have seen from my images that they prefer to have super smooth water effect, and uh, the clouds should also be very smooth. Uh, I invest a lot in the use of negative space, like in this image. Uh, it doesn't always work, but in certain images, depending on the shape of the subject or the character of the subject, uh, the, the use of negative space is uh, strongly uh, suggested and required. And um, the mood of the image, either it's a high key one or a quite uh, dark and moody one, like, uh, like this image here with uh, the bench, uh, it depends on the, uh, the things that come to my mind when I'm taking when I'm making the shot, when I'm, I'm making the capture. So it's not always, uh, of course, my images are not that joyful, if I can say so. Uh, nobody will uh, look at my images to, to be happy. It's more like uh, uh, an invitation to think differently on some, on some subjects and maybe uh, realize that we as humans, we are not just here to eat, drink, and uh, be joyful. Uh, we are able to uh, uh, visualize, thing, visualize things. We are able to uh, inspect and ponder upon some uh, subjects that it wasn't possible to do it uh, if you will not see an image under a fine art perspective. Uh, I mean, for example, this one is just a, a water meter. Who would ever think of shooting just a water meter, a depth meter in normal photography? Okay, so this is uh, basically what I do, uh, turning ordinary subjects, uh, real, uh, ordinary life subjects into something beautiful, into something that has life. And I also am very fond of uh, the sense of decay, uh, like maybe for this image with a wreck boat, now it's in pieces. And um, of course, my titles uh, are uh, there to uh, complete the image and uh, reflect what I have in mind, like I said, in one word or a few words. Um, through the years, I, I uh, found out that 
uh, heavy post processing is not that required and not and don't make complicated things uh, regarding post processing it's uh, uh, more or less a simple process that I follow and but still uh, of course I invest a lot a lot of uh, things in details if you see my images in 100 percent you will see that all of them are well taken care of and um, of course to me having these images in print is like seeing uh, if i can say so a newborn <laughs> uh, this is what i call them newborns uh, and uh, this was indeed uh, made me brought me goosebumps uh, when i saw my first printed image uh, i was overwhelmed uh, and i said this is this is part of me it's, it was a great feeling. Of course, speaking of prints, uh, I have to say that uh, these types of images are pretty demanding regarding the specifications of the papers. You can't uh, bring forth this, this effect, what you see in your screen, to put it on paper. You have to uh, choose carefully on your papers, your, your inks, your printers. Uh, it's not uh, just an ordinary print. Uh, mostly because um, the dynamic range of these images is uh, uh, is uh, so uh, dense so so wide and you have to cover from pure dark to pure white in a single paper and we all know that papers don't uh, uh, emit light they just reflect light so uh, this is of course another another talk that we can do about printing and papers uh, I have, uh, I think I have chosen between 10 or 12 different papers to come to a decision. And uh, of course, um, the print lab went crazy when I always go, uh, went there and there and I told them, mm, this one, no, this, no, this, no. And I remember a time when we covered the whole floor with prints and we came with just one good print, uh, but it's worth it, of course. Uh, of course, uh, now modern screens are able to reproduce all these images with great fidelity and uh, they have uh, great specifications, but to me, nothing compares to a real print that you can see uh, and feel. So, um, more or less, uh, this is uh, what I have to say about myself. Um, I, I really like what I do. Uh, I, I let it uh, live within me. It's not uh, uh, mostly about uh, the financial issues and uh, uh, the mundane stuff that is related with photography. It's more about uh, uh, creating a different me within photography. Uh, of course, we make a living maybe out of different things and uh, we have our family, we have our friends, but with this type of photography, we also have our personal private world that we have created and we are able to live in for some minutes, some hours. So I hope everyone feels the same way about this. Uh, of course, it's not uh, uh, what most people will select to uh, hone their skills or photography. And many people choose portraits or street photography or landscape photography. Uh, of course, it's to his own. I've learned that uh, we will, throughout the years that we are dealing with photography, we will like lots of different genres, but we will fall in love only with one or two of them. And this, uh, this genre that we will fall in love with will consume most of our time and our passion. Okay, so uh, enough with uh, this talk. And uh, I think that uh, we should proceed to the second part. Uh, Stephen, what do you think? Should we proceed to the second part? Presenting yes, some? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Theodore, you can go to the second part, no worries. Okay, unless you have some questions to ask. Um, ask. There aren't any questions right, right now from, from the floor, but if anyone would like to ask something, they can either raise the hand or um, uh, obviously write into the chat and I will uh, and I will coordinate the questions accordingly but you can you 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 can go to the second part you've got I, th I think Stephen 
I think Stephen wants to ask something. Yes, okay. And there is and there is Tony as well. I'll uh, oh, okay. open Stephen's mic. Sorry. Um, Theodore, I don't I don't know if I'm going to anticipate you, but you mentioned paper, the type of paper, yeah. and you examined various types of paper. Um, which one did you find uh, um, uh, good for your type of photography? Uh, well, Stephen, I will speak from experience. Of course, I'm not sponsored by any brand. I have to say that, of course. Um, and uh, I, of course, there might be some other good options that I haven't discovered yet. Uh, however, I found out that for this type of photography and the way I want to um, uh, present my images, first of all, matte papers are out of the question. Okay, uh, this faded effect that matte papers have, it's not what I'd like to see for my images. You use a lot of impact, you use a lot of contrast, and um, certainly uh, a pearl type of, uh, of paper, uh, barita types of uh, papers, they are very good for this, uh, types of images. Uh, of course, I speak only for myself. Maybe other people have different uh, opinions. And um, I have found out that uh, the two papers from Inova uh, have very good uh, uh, final result. The first one is the IFA 09 and the IFA uh, 49. There are two papers that I have they have tremendous dynamic range. You see, the main uh, problem that I had with uh, some different papers was that uh, they produced lots of banding because you've already seen that uh, most of my images have very uh, smooth and uh, uh, very smooth gradations from total dark to total white. And this is a very demanding uh, job for, for a paper. Okay, we're not dealing with uh, uh, flowers or a forest where you have lots of uh, texture. Uh, almost, uh, I would say, 80% of my frames are uh, just flat surfaces and uh, not all papers are able to uh, uh, make something good out of a print. I mean, it, it's very difficult uh, for a paper to reproduce what you've seen on screen. And this is why uh, my fine art books cost a lot. It's, it's just impossible uh, to, to, to have a good result with cheap papers. Okay, uh, so when uh, people ask uh, to have a book from me, uh, I state the price. And uh, if they say that they want something cheaper, I, I just uh, say to them, it's impossible to do it. Either this or nothing. So it's it's not about the 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 cost, the actual cost. It's about the quality. So if I see something that I don't like, it's not good. It's not going outside my office. Okay. So I have found, like I said, the Inova. It's not a well-known brand. Many people know about Hanemulia or Ilford. They are exceptional companies, of course, exceptional brands, but. I have found that uh, these two papers, the IFA uh, 09 and 49, they give great results for what I do. Okay, some people might think otherwise. They have other choices. Of course, it depends on the print lab. I don't have a printer of my own. I go to an outside lab and print. And uh, that's, that's what I have to say about the prints. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Tony at Sopardi. Mm -hmm. Tony? Uh, hello, Theodore. Uh, you listen, you're hearing me? You? Yes, yes, yes. Hearing me? Theodore, uh, what inspires you most and uh, what gives you your impetus? And uh, are there any artists, if any, that inspire you to be so, to have such a, an advanced and high level of art? This is a very good question. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, I'd like to say that I really admire the works of uh, many photographers. Uh, of course, our, our group of uh, fine art photographers is uh, quite limited compared to wedding photographers or fashion photographers or classic landscape photographers or street photographers. 
uh, but still, uh, of course, there are uh, tens of uh, uh, photographers that ad I really admire their work. And I uh, have to say that I'm pretty selective uh, in uh, which people I follow on Facebook. It's not about being polite. It's about uh, uh, learning something from them and keep following the work. Okay. So uh, I'd like to speak more about motivation in, instead of inspiration. Okay. To me, being inspired by someone, it might uh, lead to some sort of plagiarism and imitating the work of others. Yes. So uh, uh, being inspired by others is uh, like that, but being motivated by others is a different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, about, uh, you see the works of uh, a certain photographer, of you, for example, and I'm motivated to go out and shoot, do some things of my own. So if you stick to, uh, uh, keep watching, uh, watching the, works, the works of other photographers, eventually you start imitating them. I agree yeah. about motivation. Yes, I think that's the word I, I wish yeah. to say. There's a difference between... Yes, that's what I meant to say, yes. Motivation. Thank okay. you. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, I can name uh, uh, a few photographers. Uh, like many people, I started uh, uh, with the works of Michael Kenner. He was one of the first uh, photographers that... Uh, 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 dealt with this kind of photography. However, I have to say that uh, uh, even though some people say that oh, uh, this photographer coined the term long exposure or he was the first that uh, wor worked with uh, long exposure photography, for example, I think that this doesn't matter a lot. Okay, there is no God in this type of photography or any other type of photography. And uh, I also have to say that we are free to uh, judge the work of everybody, even the well-known photographers, and we are free to express our uh, impressions of them. Open uh, yes. I don't want to name certain photographers, but I have to say that, um, for example, everybody knows Ansel Adams. Forgive me uh, for saying that I, I just like maybe no, no more than 10 of his works. This might be a sacrilege to say, okay? But uh, it's uh, photography, it's more about either an impression is born within you or it's not. Of course, we have to keep in mind the conditions and the equipment that these people used when they took the shots. And uh, for us today, with all those digital cameras and uh, all this helpful equipment and applications, it's quite easy to uh, take a similar shot. But uh, even though uh, we are allowed uh, to judge their work, okay? And uh, we are allowed to say that I'm not uh, uh, motivated or I'm not inspired by a very well-known photographer. Okay. And, Thank you. Um, this, if I can say a few words about the competitions, uh, because I had in mind uh, that uh, uh, Sooner or later, someone would ask me why you are not participating in any kinds of uh, competitions and awards. Uh, I think that this type of photography cannot be measured by any means. And um, apart from the fact that we, we all know that uh, most of these uh, uh, plat awards platforms are uh, just cash machines for some people, uh, it's uh, just uh, plain simple to understand that when you are judged by a certain person for your photography, uh, this uh, decision, either you are awarded or not, changes when a different panel of judges is in front of you. So let's say that there are five people that are making the decision who, uh, who will get the award and who will not. And uh, maybe I won't make it. Okay, maybe I won't get an award. If five different people look at my image, they might love it. If another set of five people look at my image, they might hate it. Okay, so it's not always about technicalities and keeping the specifications in order. It's uh, just a love-hate situation sometimes. So this type of photography, it's, uh, it's not easy to judge it. So I decided to not take part in any types of competitions and uh, 
maybe this is a, a right decision for me. I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Theodore, we've got uh, another question from Emmanuel Muscat. He's asking you whether you set your camera to take black and white directly or whether you do them in post-processing to convert them in black and white. I prefer to shoot, to shoot in color because uh, I have to also think of uh, the way some colors interact uh, when you are switching to black and white. Um, of course, it's easy to switch to a black and white profile in, in your camera, but I never do that uh, because uh, when I'm converting an image to black and white, I uh, alter the settings of the, of the color sliders. So when I have some uh, strong and uh, well-defined colors, I need to have them in mind when I'm doing the post-processing uh, at my office. Okay, so I always shoot in color. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers your question, Emmanuel. Um, uh, no more questions so far, so you can so, continue. Okay, I, maybe it's a good uh, idea to proceed with uh, explaining some uh, the thought process behind some of my images. Uh, I will switch to the Adobe Bridge. Can you see the images now? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I will start with an image that is titled Uncharted Archipelago. This is the initial image. As you can see, it's shot in color, of course, like all of my images. This uh, uh, shot was taken during one of uh, the workshops that I did last year uh, at the Axios Delta. It's a great location. Uh, I have learned fine art photography uh, and long exposure photography in the Pacific in this place. And uh, this boat is just uh, not used anymore. It's uh, as you can see, uh, there is a uh, lot of water inside the boat. So um, when I first saw this uh, this subject, I uh, of course took my time to uh, inspect the different uh, uh, parts of the boat and see what is interesting to include and what it's not. Uh, a few minutes ago, I talked about uh, carefully positioning the camera. Uh, in relation to the subject. So uh, for this image, uh, I would like to say that, uh, let's, let's annotate uh, here, let's draw some uh, explanatory lines. Uh, as you can see, um, there is an amount of water inside, inside the boat. So if I, play, if I decided to place the camera uh, too low, I would miss this spot over here, which I found to be interesting. If I would place the camera too high, uh, the whole shot would look like a drone shot, like I was hiding from above. So uh, in this way, it would uh, lose all its uh, directionality, like uh, going from the shore to the far horizon. Okay, uh, of course, uh, describing how you place your camera on screen, it's uh, a completely different thing uh, compared to describing it live on location. But still, I think you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. Of course, there are some interesting spots over here, like the ropes, this one and this one, that are very strong elements. So to me, uh, it looked like the boat uh, wants to, to live to uncharted waters and uh, the, the ropes keep it to the shore. Okay, and uh, later you will see that I work very much with contrast in mind. Contrast to me is not only about tonalities, like many people think. It's also about uh, a combination of elements, like uh, over here, we have uh, flat elements combined with well-defined elements. We have uh, portions of the frame with uh, no texture at all, combined with a lot of texture. Okay, we have some pointy subjects here combined with a very flat uh, uh, surface around it. So contrast is... Uh, just the play of the opposites. Sometimes it's about tonalities, at other times it's about shapes or about uh, textures. Okay, and uh, of course, when I took this shot, I also had in mind how I will crop the, lim the image later on. Uh, my, my camera doesn't have a, a square uh, format for a RAW file, other cameras do. Uh, 
so I had to use the grid line on the on the screen to uh, visualize how this image would uh, look like in in square in, in a square crop. And what I did afterwards when I took the shot uh, uh, and uh, worked with some software later on, what I did uh, was to let me check here. Proceed with the image. Uh, Okay, this is the, the second one, the second part of the of the uh, editing. As you can see, I have, oops, sorry. As you can see over here, I have removed almost everything except for the boat. And uh, this was uh, in order to uh, remove all distracting elements. I mean, here, as you can see, is the yellow boat, is the well-defined a piece of land over here to the horizon line. I found out that these will be distracting to the eye, so I removed them. And then I made a square crop with a sky replacement. Okay, and this is the final result. As you can see over here, uh, the, uh, the boat is placed in such a position as to start from the lower third right of, uh, of the frame and end to the, to the center of the frame. This way uh, you can keep the, uh, the interest inside the frame. Uh, I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. I, I mean, uh, you have a directional line over here starting from the lower third uh, of the right to the center of the frame. And this is very crucial to keep the interest inside the frame and not, not let the eye go to the edges of the frame. For example, uh, if I may, if I would make a crop, uh, a different crop, like maybe this one. Okay, as you can see, the eye is immediately drawn to the left edge of the frame, which to me is not good. So careful, careful framing and careful cropping is really, really crucial to the end result and the, and the whole impression of the image. So here I, I uh, followed the rule of thirds in a way that might not be uh, really pronounced. Uh, I mean, I have placed uh, the back part of the, cam of, the, of the boat to the lower right third of the crop. Okay, and um, and this is uh, pretty much what's going on with this image. Uh, it's it's a, it's to me it's a very 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 good image because it combines the sense of uh, something ethereal uh, uh, combined with uh, uh, the sea, the clouds, uh, the the sense of uh, decay with uh, with the boat, uh, and it's like putting the boat in a in an unknown location, uh, uh, to me, removing the, the horizon line uh, plays a crucial role, role, all including it, of course. Uh, it's a decision that I make when I decide on what type of atmosphere I want to create in an image. So when you uh, uh, include the, the horizon line, you give a, a well-defined uh, sense of where you, your subject is. I mean. If there was a horizon line, you would say, okay, it was, this shot was taken at a certain location, stuff like that. But when you remove the horizon line, like this image, you have the boat uh, floating in clouds, maybe. So this gives a more ethereal, a more moody effect to the subject. So this is as far as uh, replacing elements. This is as far as I go. Uh, I don't uh, uh, include foreign elements in my images. If I do something as a replacement, it's just the sky and nothing more. And only if it's uh, required. Okay. So, Theodore. Uh, Theodore. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a question, please? Um, yeah, yes, uh, of course. I, I'm, I'm not, I am, I, I, this is just for, for my own knowledge. When you shoot these type of images, for example, you're shooting a boat over here. Um, yeah. How how would you um, uh, 
mitigate the movement when shooting it in long exposure. I mean, there, there's, the boat would, it's not just like when you're shooting a pier, which is fixed. Yeah. It's a question that I must uh, really, really hundreds of times, I would say, uh, Vince. Uh, when you see a boat that is standing still, it's actually standing still. I never imitate this effect. I have some other images where the, the boat looks like a ghost. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, so the boat is actually moving. So when you see uh, images with my boats standing still, they are really standing still. For example, this, if you can, if you can uh, see the initial image, uh, this one, the, boat, the, the water level is really low. It's very shallow waters. Okay. okay. As you can see here, the, the, the rope is clearly seen. I mean, uh, the, the level of the water is maybe 10 centimeters or so. Okay. And also, you have the weight of the of the of the water inside the boat, so this this makes the boat standing still. Ah, okay. 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 And, but because uh, it, I mean, it's it's, it's not, still. It's not, uh, it's not a combination of, of two shots. Okay. If you are asking okay. something like this, I only I might only do that, uh, and not for boats, but maybe for other uh, stationary subjects when it's really really windy. It's, it's, and it's just impossible to take a single shot. Okay. Speaking of which, I don't do exposure stacking. Okay. I don't know if you are familiar with this term. Uh, some people prefer to, uh, instead of making one shot of uh, maybe four minutes, they are making four shots of one minute. Yes. In fact, that's the, the um, normally um, I use that type of, of, uh, of system. Yes, I, I shoot uh, short exposures for 30 seconds, and then I stack them in, in, in post-processing. But I was curious because the boat is incredibly sharp. It's still incredibly yeah. sharp, and you, yeah. you've used <laughs> you've used the LO shutter, obviously, to get that. that yeah, you know, actually, uh, this one is, uh, uh, let me check. 180 seconds, 91 seconds. Three okay. minutes of exposure. Okay, so um, this is what I do. I, I don't imitate the effect and also don't imitate the long exposure effect on the water. I have seen so many bad images of uh, imitating the long exposure effect by using uh, heavy blurring on the, on the water, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it really shows really bad. And uh, it's what's the I mean what's the purpose of uh, uh, doing this I don't know. Yes. yes. Uh, it, it for me this is uh, some sort of uh, ritual. Uh, all this time that passes throughout the exposure is like making a small movie, a short movie uh, about uh, how time affects certain subjects. It's about describing the pass of time on certain uh, subjects like the boat. Okay, so all this uh, all this uh, impression is lost when you are imitating the effect. Certainly, okay. certainly. If you if you try to imitate the effect, this is some this is practically similar to when you try to mimic panning instead of doing it in camera. You try to use yeah, the motion blur. That's, that's correct. The transitioning of pixels are different, and if mm -hmm. you were to look at it closely, you would notice that it is not done in camera. Mm -hmm. And this is also the case with uh, these types of, of images. If you are quite experienced in long exposure photography, you can immediately spot the difference, the difference between a real long exposure shot and uh, a fabricated one. Okay, uh, speaking about sky replacement, uh, like in uh, this image, uh, as you have seen, I am making a smooth transition between the sea and the clouds. It's a technique that I have developed and it works really great. Um, it's easy for, by using lots of software these days to just replace a certain part of the frame with a different sky, but doing this smooth transition from a, a lower part to the upper part, uh, you have to do it on your own. Okay, I think it works great on the after effect like this one. Okay, so let's move on to another image here. Uh, this was shot at the Mesolongi Lagoon. Uh, it's uh, 
in the middle part of Greece. It's uh, another great location to do long exposure photography. And what I found uh, interesting here was the, this, this gap over here. As you may have seen, there is no foreground element. And uh, this uh, sort of fence, if I can say so, it's uh, something uh, very interesting. It's repetitive in its structure, but there is a gap over here. So when I saw this image, I said, uh, it looks like uh, there are some photons that are uh, captured here and they found this uh, gap, this gate to, to escape. So this image was called escape of photons. And this is the end result. As you can see, there are, lot, there are lots of different types of, of contrast here. I mean, you can find dark, spot, dark parts of the frame combined with bright parts. Uh, you can find uh, uh, well-defined uh, parts of the, of, the, of the fence over here combined with flat parts. And of course, the eye of uh, the viewer is kept to the center, which is uh, uh, the brightest part throughout the frame. And of course, it reflects the sense of uh, gathered photons. Okay, um, here I decided to uh, do a sky replacement, but this time to include a horizon line. So this, as you can see, creates a sense of uh, dimension. It looks most, uh, most like a, a manipulated landscape shot, if I can say so. Uh, so it, it isn't uh, so much airy or ethereal like the previous one. And uh, this is actually a very, a very a good subject, but no one, if you can look to the, to the initial image, no one would even think of taking a shot of this. I mean, it's completely uh, not interesting to shoot as, a, as an instant shot, I mean. But when you visualize it under a fine art perspective, it becomes something different, becomes something very interesting. Okay, so let's move on. This is a, a shot taken at the same location, maybe uh, one kilometer next to the previous one. And uh, this spot at the Mesolongi Lagoon offers lots of uh, uh, different uh, options regarding framing and subjects and stuff like that. Uh, I decided to uh, present this image as an example of how to uh, work in a subtractive way and uh, find interest in uh, not only in, in the subject, but also in the form of uh, three combined subjects like the boats on, in the center. So as you can see, uh, these uh, three boats create a diagonal line. And you can only see that if you place the camera at a certain position related to the subjects. If you place the camera in a wrong position, you won't see that. I mean, the gap between them and the alignment of the three boats. So what I did was to remove the, these boats over here, which are a different subject. I have another image with these boats included. I removed this boat over here. And of course, the top part over here was removed. As you can see in this capture, uh, Vince, uh, the boats are moving. Yes. So this answers your previous question. Yes, yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So these boats are actually moving. They have this ghostly effect, if I can say so. Mm -hmm. And of course, here you also have the sense of contrast regarding stationary parts like these tag poles over here combined <laughs> with moving boats, flat surfaces combined with well defined subjects, pointy uh, shapes combined with flat shapes. All these are aspects of contrast. Okay, and you have to take this under consideration when you are making the capture. Okay. And this is what, mainly what I'm trying to explain to the participants of my workshops. I mean, uh, after a couple of shots, it's quite easy to understand how to calculate the exposure time or how to uh, pick your camera settings, but it's really, really difficult to work on, on the framing of, uh, of each subject. And it's very crucial. And of course, like I said before, you can't fix that in Photoshop later. Either you'd make it a good capture on location or not. Okay, so as I said before, what I did here was to uh, remove 
uh, the left part elements and the right part elements. And um, this is the end result. I did the sky replacement also here, and I kept these just these three uh, boats placed at the center. They look like they are marching to the shore, if I can say so. It's a pretty interesting subject. You 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 always keep eyes low, right? The lowest. Yes, thing. yes. I always uh, shoot at uh, the base uh, ISO, and of course, the only real ISO of uh, my camera is uh, 100, okay. and. Uh, I always uh, shoot at this setting unless there are some uh, instances where uh, I go maybe to half ISO 50 or ISO 200, depending on the, the flow of the water, depending on the light, depending, uh, of course, I have a, a good set of filters, but sometimes you need uh, to have exposure times of uh, between, uh, like, uh, for example, I have a 13 stop and 12, 12 stop. But when you're shooting for uh, quite long, okay, the difference from four minutes to another stop is eight minutes. <laughs> it's huge. So uh, you have uh, to think of some solutions uh, to get, for example, a shot of six minutes. So you will raise the ISO in this, okay. in this instance. Okay, so uh, this is about uh, solving some problems that might occur du during the exposure. And I will also show you uh, when, as we move on and a, a situation when I decided to turn the problem into an opportunity. I will show you later on. And uh, this is also another example. This is a shot uh, close to Thessaloniki. Thessaloniki is uh, the sub-capital of Greece. It's very close to the Axios Delta. And uh, what you are seeing here is a very good example of how to level uh, your camera in relation to the subject in order to have a very good effect regarding leading lines. Uh, if you can see here, uh, there is a cormorant and actually this shot was taken under uh, dense fog. This is, a, uh, this is a behind the scenes shot. Okay, so this is fog that they are seeing in the background. And I had to place the camera almost inside the water to get this image. Okay, so if you would place the camera far too high, you would lose this sense of being inside the corridor, if I can say so. Here we have uh, very strong uh, leading lines. I think it's uh, quite clear what I mean. Okay. They, uh, it's easy to lead the eye to the center. And uh, actually this image required a really, really low uh, level of post-processing. I mean, it was almost ready to be turned to black and white and call it a finished image because the background was already prepared. Lots of negative, negative space by design, if I can say so. And um, some people might ask about the bird over here. Well, uh, it stood there throughout the capture and even more, this cormorant. It's, uh, if uh, you know about some things about these birds, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, quite common to see them standing still maybe for half an hour or so. Of course, they are moving a bit. They are not perfectly still, but uh, they are part of the actual capture. So uh, for my part, you will never see birds added in post, like a composite. Okay, so let's move on to another image. Like I said, this is a perfect example. This is called black needles because the reflections are such that create some uh, shapes like needles. Okay, and uh, as you can see, there is a very strong contrast be between uh, bright parts and dark parts, pointy subjects, piercing flat surfaces. There's contrast everywhere. Okay, so let's move on to another image. This is also a behind the scenes shot. As you can see, this is a, uh, for me, this is a great example of how to isolate your subject. Uh, I mean, here you, can, you might find a multitude of subjects 
I don't know what this actually is. Uh, I think they are parts of a concrete pl platform, maybe, I don't know, which was removed later on. But I, uh, when I saw these uh, uh, cubes of concrete, if I can say so, with these uh, iron legs, <laughs> if I can also say so, it reminded me of some strange creatures that are diving inside the sea looking for something like ducks that are that dive in, in the water to find food. So uh, what I did was to decide which parts to keep and which to exclude, which sub, uh, would, what will suffice as a subject, uh, what should I remove. So this is the end result. This image is called Curious Divers. Okay. And uh, as you can see, the difference is immense when you are dealing with long exposure photography. It's the, the frame is completely transformed. Okay, what I decided to keep is just these uh, four parts, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And I remove, we removed everything else from the frame. Okay, and... Uh, this is the end result. Some people might argue that uh, there is a rule that says uh, don't include four elements or two elements or six elements in your frame, include odd numbers like one, three or five. Well, I thought that this pattern was very interesting. So this time uh, I decided to, get, to go against the rules of how many uh, uh, parts to include. Odd numbers versus uh multiple numbers anyway so i i think that is a quite interesting image of course it's really really awful when you see it uh, as an instant shot there's nothing to see here nothing of interest okay so this is the end result this is this the image that i was talking about reg regarding uh, uh, taking a problem and transforming it to an opportunity uh, where the, this image was shot at a peace, very peaceful bay in central Greece, near Lamia. And uh, what I had in mind was to take a shot only of this uh, stick over here. I think you can see it. Okay. Uh, I, so I had in mind to make a very, very minimal shot only with the sea and this small stick, this small pole over here. So while, while I was doing the capture, this boat started to intrude in the image and it gained uh, a certain, uh, certain movement uh, by going uh, forth and back, forth and back, forth and back. And at first I was frustrated because I said, oh, come on, this boat is ruining my frame. But then I, I thought, hey, why don't you, uh, it's better to use this boat as part of the subject, as part of the frame. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this uh, impression that the boat gave to me uh, gave birth to the title. The title is Fluid Intrusion. Okay, so I saw the, the boat like it was intruding in the frame without uh, me asking the boat to, to, to be part of the, of the frame. Uh, it's pretty arrogant <laughs> for the boat to, to do that, but it was for, for uh, something good. I mean, this is, this is the end result. As you can see, I decided to keep the background elements and give my frame the sense of, the, of uh, a certain location. And uh, of course, Vince, again, as you can see, the boat is moving. Okay, and I'd like to uh, make a reference to another uh, composition uh, uh, element here. It's about the factor of uh, tension. Uh, as you can see, I decided to uh, cut out the back part of the boat and not include the whole of the boat. This was done intentionally. I, uh, this is the part that I'm talking about. Okay, I decided to uh, cut out the back part of the boat because I wanted to uh, exaggerate on the, on the effect of, of uh, the boat intruding in the frame. Okay, it was a sudden appearance. Uh, so, it, actually, Theodore, what what I want, what I observe over here, and even it's a comment that even Anthony Schwerer 
pass this comment in the chat. I think these types of photography, the, the ones that we're seeing over here, the boat with a kind of a minimalistic effect, I think they work more in a square format. So you were good in choosing the right type of format because I, I like this as it is. In fact, you've placed even that, you know, that the, 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 this, this piece of wood over here in the middle of, of, of the image. This, this part yeah, of it here, you mean? Yes, the start of a pier. If, if, since it is, it's, a, it's, it's a square format, it, it, it can be placed, in my opinion, I like it to be placed in the middle, but obviously it would change the whole scenario if the image wasn't in a square format. Because I, I can see a sense of symmetry as well in, in, this, in this image. You know, given, given even, even the others, uh, the previous ones, I can see a sense of symmetry, the way that you're using very clever enough the, the square format. Yeah. I uh, also would like to say, uh, you're speaking of uh, symmetry. I would also like to add the, the, the factor of balance of elements in an image. Yes. yes. OK. Yes. This is also uh, a crucial part of framing, of uh, careful and correct framing. And uh, I have seen lots of examples of uh, unbalanced images. Yes. OK. Uh, I've, I think everybody knows what I'm talking about regarding yes, balance yes, yes, of yes. elements. OK. Uh, so, uh, as I said before, I, I decided to cut out this part of the boat in order to enhance and make clear that the boat actually intruded in the frame. It busted in. Yes. Okay. So and I, I didn't ask her to do that. So, this is the end result. And uh, it not only uh, beautified my, uh, <laughs> my frame, it was actually the key element of the frame. Yes, yes, yes. And here you can also see the, the, the factor of, uh, um, of contrast. Here you have a still part as a subject, and here you have a moving subject. And they are combined, they interact. This is contrast also. Yes, okay. that's right. Uh, uh, Celine is asking you, Theodore, sorry to, to interrupt. She's asking yeah. if you shoot uh, in automatic mode, or do you choose the aperture and shutter speed according to your subject? I would say that the latter. Yeah. Uh, uh, at first, I'm making a test shot, an instant shot. I, I work in aperture mode. And uh, I find this uh, capture useful in order to have a read of the time of uh, the initial capture, of the exposure time. I mean, I have to check the uh, depth of field, sharpness, focusing, stuff like that. And um, uh, when I'm finished with that, then I proceed uh, working in manual mode and, of course, in bulb mode. So the first image, the test image, is taken in aperture mode and the actual capture is made in, in manual mode and I switch the exposure time to bulb. Okay. Very good. Uh, speaking of which, regarding calculating the exposure time, I think uh, it's more or less easy to do that now uh, with all these applications that are very, very helpful. But sometimes you have to improvise and uh, uh, make some changes. And for example, in this image, as you can see, the, um, in the initial shot, I have some reflections from the sun. Uh, I was lucky enough, and during the exposure, the sun was behind the clouds. OK. But this will be uh, maybe uh, something different might happen. And if the sun came up, I would end the exposure shorter, uh, sooner than I was calculated uh, before. OK, so let's proceed with another image. This is a completely different type of, uh, uh, of fine art photography. It's architectural photography. And I'm dealing with these types of images uh, in shortage of uh, uh, subjects or locations. I have to say that uh, during the pandemic, I'm not able to travel even uh, throughout Greece. And uh, I decided to work on different types of fine art photography. Of course, here in Greece, we don't have uh, that many uh, interesting architectural buildings mod of modern architecture. I mean, uh, I mean, it's not Valencia here and <laughs> uh, or, or uh, the Hafen city of uh, Hamburg. Uh, these are 
gems of architectural photography. Okay, uh, so we have some interesting subjects, and I'm lucky enough to have uh, 10, 15 of them close to where I live. So this is one of them. This is uh, not that interesting subject to, to look at. It's a, it's a cluster of offices. It's a big company. Uh, so when I saw this, this, uh, this facade, uh, it was quite interesting for me because uh, uh, it has uh, lots of strong elements in the, in the, in the front face. Uh, and this, this is the end result. Okay, this image uh, is, uh, depends hugely on uh, exposure grads. Okay, I, I removed, of course, the, the background. It's easy when, it's, uh, uh, when you have clear skies, it's easy to make selections instead of having lots of clouds. Uh, so uh, what I did was just to remove the background and replace it with a flat color layer. And uh, I uh, uh, gave uh, more, uh, much importance to the, to the front part over here. I made it more shiny and uh, I used exposure grads to make the edges a bit darker. So this gives to the subject a sense of dim uh, three dimensionality, if I can say so. And uh, it's not that much different from the initial capture, as you can see. Uh, did you arrange the verticals in, in post-processing? I used uh, the uh, distortion correction from uh, Adobe Camera Raw. I don't have a tilt shift lens. Okay, you use the geometry, okay. right? The geometry. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, uh, in fact, I just, in fact clicked, I just clicked on the automatic setting. The automatic which, setting. Uh, in which fact, worked really, really well for the yeah, yeah. The, the, later, the latest version, even Steve was, was telling me about it, as well, the latest version, the 2021, um, they, they've improved um, tremendously the geometry part. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even the verticals, they automatically, they, they uh, uh, even in, in conjunction with the content aware extent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it also um, takes care of the, the, the distortions as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty clever now. So uh, this is another image that is a very good example of using negative space and the factor of tension in, in an image. Uh, this is actually a, a Dakota uh, a carrier plane, a DC-3. Of course, uh, it's retired, if I can say so, and it's uh, quite close to where I live. It's actually, it was actually used for a couple of decades as a cafeteria. People could actually go there and sit and have their coffee and uh, talk. A pretty interesting cafeteria, if you ask me. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's it's standing in a position that you don't have so many framing options. So I decided uh, to take a shot of just the nose, and this is the end result. It's actually a total absence of surrounding elements. It's a huge uh, uh, amount of negative space here. And also, uh, there is a, a strong presence of uh, this tension factor that I was talking about before. Uh, as you can see, the nose of the, of the, of the aircraft is uh, intruding in the frame, and you uh, just want to keep looking at the nose. You, want, you don't want to take your eyes off the, of the aircraft. Okay, even if you look elsewhere, your eyes are immediately drawn to the subject. Okay, and this, uh, the way that I cut the front part, and I don't include the whole of the, of, the, of the plane, is done intentionally, of course, in order to enhance the sense of tension and the sense of the, the subject that is intruding in the frame. So I would easily replace the sky with some clouds, but I decided not to, in order to enhance the sense of negative space. As, as you can see here, there are, also very strong uh, uh, examples of, of, uh, of contrast. I mean, you have completely flat surfaces uh, interacting with pointy parts over here. You have very dark parts with bright parts. You have uh, no information, zero texture here, combined with lots of texture over here. Bright, uh, dark parts, bright parts, dark parts over here to the windows. It's, it, again, contrast is everywhere. 
And of course, the position, the placement of the nose of the airplane is on, according to the rule of thirds. Okay, it's on the lower left third of the frame. So, uh, let's proceed to another image. Uh, this, this is a, uh, I think this is a great example of uh, effective use of cast light. This is another architectural image. It's uh, this, uh, uh, this building is very interesting. It's close to Thessaloniki again. And uh, if you uh, make some good preparations regarding the position of the sun, you can have uh, uh, such, a uh, such a reflection of, of the light on the building in order to have this effect. It looks like a, a spine, <laughs> if I can say so. Okay, it's it may, to some people might look like a, an alien creature. I don't know. Of course, here there is a heavy use of exposure grads also, and it was easy to remove the, the sky part from behind. But if you, uh, if you uh, stand here at a different time of the day, the result is completely different because you will lose this interaction between bright parts and dark parts over here. If the sun passes to the left, the whole of the left part is lighted and you will lose this structure over here. So it's an example of being there at the right, at the right moment. Okay, and uh, let's move on to another image here. This is a, a newly founded uh, library at uh, a city uh, quite close to where I live. Uh, I found interesting, this is a, a quite uh, unusual shooting angle. Okay, this is the end result. Again, heavy use of exposure grads. And the pointy part over here made all the difference. Of course, it's placed again according to the rule of thirds. And uh, the, this tip, the, the, the lower tip of, of, the, of the building is carefully placed to the lower left uh, part of the frame. Uh, it has a strange uh, shape. So this image was actually a study on shapes. And uh, the, the cast light was, uh, has, had created a quite strong effect here. If it were, uh, were a, a cloudy day, an overcast day, the effect would be completely different. So the, the surface over here would be a very low contrast. It will have a very low contrast, which wouldn't be that helpful. And uh, so I visited this place during a very sunlit day uh, in order to have this effect, to take, to make good use of uh, the cast light. Speaking of which, uh, I prefer to take long exposure images during overcast days because the, the light, the quality of light is really, really uh, good. It's diffused light compared to directional light like this one. So, uh, the contrast is pretty harsh here, and um, you also, it, also in technical terms, uh, you are able to use longer exposure times when it's overcast, because uh, there is a huge difference between this image, which was shot at uh, maybe one of a fiftieth, uh, considering to other images that I have uh, one to four, maybe, and uh, the initial exposure time plays a, uh, plays a crucial role to the whole exposure time later on when you put on the filters. And this, look at the symbols. Who would even think of taking a shot of this? Okay, uh, it's just uh, a remains of an old uh, jetty. There's a really, really nothing to it. Uh, of course, unless you consider this boat over here to the, to the background something interesting, uh, apart from that, there, there, there is really, really nothing to see. But the, the, the transforming power of the long exposure effect is such as to, I mean, the, look at the end result. It's re really, uh, I think that it's uh, something that uh, only 
uh, a photographer like us would find interest in something like this. Okay, uh, of course here, there's a strong use of uh, directional lines. It's obvious to everybody. Okay, here and here. Heavy use of negative space throughout the, the frame. And of course, you have lots of uh, uh, contrast regarding tonalities, regarding uh, texture, shapes. Again, here, contrast is everywhere. And um, I think uh, we can proceed to, to another image. This shot also is a study on, uh, on uh, cast light. This was actually taken a few years ago. Uh, it's, a one of, uh, it's two of the famous pyramids of the Louvre Museum. I was there during uh, an international exhibition to which I participated. Uh, I think it was 2018, uh, I think so. And um, this is the initial image. I took a shot of these two pyramids aligned in a straight, uh, in a straight pattern. And this is the end result. Really, it's just a matter of dealing with available light. Okay, I removed the background building and I kept just these two pyramids. And this is the end result. Lots of negative space, of course, here. I don't know about you, I, I really like the end result. It's a, it's a great example of how to use light, cast light, available light, and make a difference and the sense of depth between the two elements. Okay, so this image was also, uh, I, I've been asked a lot about this bird over here. Uh, Vince is something similar to the boats not moving. <laughs> okay, so uh, this, this is a, this is a, as you can see, if it, it's clearly seen, the, the, the head of the bird is a bit blurry because it was moving. So this is a cormorant that was standing there, I don't know, maybe half an hour. This is also taken at the Axios Delta during a rainy day. And these, these over here are flamingos. Here, here, they are diving for food. Mm. Here also, these are flamingos. There are lots of them at the Axios Delta. So this uh, this uh, uh, this dead tree has a really interesting uh, shape. But uh, I've been here to I, I don't know how many times. Uh, close to a hundred times, I don't know, throughout these years. It was only one time that I found, uh, that I found a bird sitting on the, on the tree. Okay, so uh, I decided to remove almost everything from the frame and this is the end result. Of course, you can dimly see the back part over here with some uh, uh, hangers uh, for, for the nets. This is actually a, a real reflection of, uh, of uh, the tree, but I removed lots of parts. I removed everything like this, 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 the, the land parts over here, uh, the fishing huts to the background. And what I did uh, uh, was to actually um, decide to place the, the, the tree in a way that it uh, turns the eye to the center of the frame. I mean, it was uh, a, a choice of uh, putting it to the left part and not to the right part of the frame because the, the bird uh, would uh, be looking to the edge of the frame and not to the center. I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, in this way, the bird, which is a very strong element of the of, of the frame is looking to the center. I mean, uh, let me show you. Okay, it's looking over here. If I decide to keep the initial frame as it was and uh, crop like this, give me a second, and maybe crop like this. Okay, 
it will look to the edge of the frame. So it will lead your eyes outside of the frame. So this was the intention. Again, I used the rule of thirds here and I placed the, uh, the root of the tree to the lower left uh, third of the frame over here. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Theodore, we've got a question from Leonard Cox. He is asking you, what do you use to convert black and white? Um, uh, to convert to black and white. Do you Which use, software? for example, you mean? sorry? Which software you mean? Wh what do you use? Do you use, for example, gradient? Sometimes, uh, lately I've been using the adjustment uh, layer from black and white for, within uh, Photoshop. Okay. At other times, when I want to create uh, lots of uh, mood and atmosphere, I use the black and white conversion panel from Exposure. I don't know if you are familiar with this software. It was formerly titled as Alien Skin Exposure. Uh, not many people know about it. Uh, actually, I'm part of the uh, beta testers of the software. And uh, it really wor works miracles with uh, placing vignettes, which is actually what uh, plays a crucial role uh, for making an atmosphere. So it's two choices for me, either exposure software or the uh, black and white adjustment uh, layer from Photoshop. Okay, so what I do is to play with the sliders, with the color sliders, and uh, uh, mostly in black, working with black and white, the cardinal colors are blue, uh, cyan, uh, uh, yellow, and red. These yeah, are the, red, the red most crucial it. colors that uh, affect the black and white image. Okay. Not red. that much for the greens, not that much for the magentas. Okay. Red to get out the whites, right? Yeah, it depends. For, uh, for example, here I use the negative value for the red in, in order to make the three go darker in contrast to the surrounding part, which was uh, maybe uh, grayish, if I can say so. So I used uh, a negative value for the red channel, for the for the red color, in order to turn it a bit dark. This is a more effective way compared to maybe burning of midons or burning of shadows, because in this situation you had to use a brush and uh, it's a, it's a quite difficult to to apply uh, a, a burn uh, technique on this uh, on this subject. It's easier to play with the color sliders. Okay. So, uh, let's move on to, to another image. Okay, this is also another example of uh, something really, really not interesting to shoot. Okay, uh, but it is completely transformed with the long exposure technique. It's a, it's a, a peach tree that is submerged in a lake. And uh, actually this was part of uh, a farm that, uh, but uh, some years ago, the level of the water in the lake uh, was high enough in order to uh, <laughs> take, uh, take all over the farm. So this is the end result. As you can see again, there's heavy use of negative space. Uh, in this image, I applied a technique uh, that is mm. a bit similar to a sky replacement, but this time it's not about clouds, it's about uh, replacing the upper part with a flat color. Okay, so uh, through the use of uh, the long exposure technique, all these textures, all this texture around here is completely eliminated because the, the water turns completely flat and uh, it's quite easy to isolate the subject and do the masking and the selections. Okay, and uh, uh, there's another thing that I'd like to say here. You have seen in some of my images that the reflections of the subjects are really long and this depends on, uh, on the movement of the, of the water. Here, in this example, it was a quite windy day as you can see from the from the from the waves, so the reflections were not 
that long. It's just this part over here. And um, at other instances, uh, the reflections are really long because you have uh, shallow waters, which means the waves are really calm. They are really, really low. And this allows for really, really long reflections, like, like this image over here. So if it was windy, you might see just a small part over here reflected, and this part over here will, will be gone. So the, the actual um, uh, movement of the, of the waves defines the structure of the reflections. Usually this, this uh, location, the Axios Delta, uh, has uh, really low levels of uh, water and uh, it's uh, quite common to have longer reflections, which I really like, instead of short ones. So, what to say about this? This is <laughs> one of your spots in Malta. Keith, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Delemara. Okay. So uh, this is the initial capture. When I saw this uh, flat uh, rock, this uh, bedrock, if I can say so, uh, it reminded me uh, of something uh, uh, primitive or something emerging out of the chaos, maybe, uh, something primordial. This is why I titled the image Primordial Forms. It's like something is emerging out of nowhere. It's rushing out of the water. It's like a, a winged uh, structure, if I can say so. These are the wings and this is the head, maybe, at least for me. And this is the end result. Of course, I replaced the sky. I had some issues that day with uh, uh, reflections of, uh, of, the, of the sun on my lens. This is why you might see here some uh, flare over here. But with patience, I, uh, I managed to remove this. And of course, it's easier to remove them uh, when you're working in black and white compared to color. I have to say that also. It's a little trick that we have in black and white. All those uh, issues and deficiencies in color differences that they are easily eliminated. This is also from Malta, the uh, St. Elmo uh, Lighthouse. And this is also another example of uh, uh, completely losing the reflections due to the movement of the, of the waves. Uh, this is the end result. I decided to play uh, with minimal uh, aspects here, uh, lots of negative space and just a strip of uh, concrete. I know this is, these are blocks of uh, some of, I don't know whether this is concrete. I don't think so. It's more like limestone. Limestone, okay, yeah. And uh, here I played with the yellow slider for the color and I turned this to uh, something dark in order to have contrast between the bright sky, the bright sea, and the, the subject over here in the middle. Of course, the, the lighthouse at the, is at the dead center. Here, I didn't make use of the rule of thirds. I decided to put the subject in the center. And I, I found interesting this slope over here that is made from the construction. It was easy to cut uh, the, the frame in a, in a different way, uh, like... Um, like maybe like this. Okay, maybe like this. But I found interesting this part over here to the left, this difference in shape. Okay, so as you can see, uh, there are no reflections because the water had such a strong movement that it didn't allow for reflections. Okay, uh, I don't know if there is anything more. This is also from Malta. 
this is a quite interesting interesting spot. Uh, I decided to go for uh, a loss of dimension here. I mean, there is a clearly defined horizon line over here to the top. And uh, I thought that this was something like uh, a creature that was uh, dipping its trunk in the water, singing for food maybe, I don't know. This is the end result. So what I did here was a replacement of the top half part with a flat color layer. And again, I used this smooth transition between the sea and the top part. So in this case, you don't have the sense of dimension. You don't actually know where uh, the horizon line is. You don't actually have the sense of uh, where this is located. But it's a very interesting construction. Uh, I was really happy to be there and take a shot of it. So that's about it. Uh, well done. I don't know. Any more thank questions? You, you. Yes, we have a question from, from Renata. She asked okay. you, you mentioned replacing sky. So you have uh, some kind of sky backgrounds to replace where they fit? Uh, I have, uh, uh, she's asking about if I have some an, ar an arsenal of uh, sky, different clouds, different skies. Yeah. yeah, I actually do. I would say I have more than 200 different skies. I've shot uh, these by, on my own. They are not stock images. They are long exposure images. And uh, sometimes I go out shooting only for skies. And I do that mostly in spring when the clouds have uh, lots of uh, texture uh, in contrast to winter when it's like this you have a very flat clouds and there's really nothing to shoot so in spring the clouds have lots and lots of texture and it's really helpful to do sky replacements and they have uh, divided them in three categories one is dramatic clouds that have really really strong textures uh, there are the, the soft ones and there are some in the middle. So according to the general mood that I want to create, I use a different type of, of um, clouds. And of course, I uh, uh, put lots of foundation to the direction of the clouds. They should be according to the subject and not contradicting in, in direction. They should have the same flow, I mean. Thank you. You're welcome. Someone else? Someone else? Is to... There aren't, I don't think there are any other questions um, from the panel. So I think uh, we can conclude, Stephen. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, we, okay. I, uh, on behalf of the Bota Photographic Society, and uh, our members, I would like to thank you, Theodore. Um, uh, I as I said, maybe maybe you have something to say about your courses for our members. Yes, I, I have uh, uh, I have split my courses in different levels and different types of uh, courses. Uh, some people like to talk about only about editing. I think that it's crucial to also talk about framing. And some of my courses are only about framing and how to position the camera in respect to the subject and stuff like that. Um, I also do portfolio evaluation of uh, other photographers, give them some tips and some helpful information on how to improve their images. And uh, of course, there are different parts on my editing process. Sometimes it's about the raw conversion or reducing how I remove some elements from the, from the image. Uh, how I fix some things uh, regarding sky replacements, stuff like that. And also a different part is about black and, black and white conversion. All this can be done live. We connect via uh, maybe a team viewer or uh, other platforms. And I also make similar video courses, which people are able to purchase and download. Uh, and I don't have ready-made videos because uh, each photographer has uh, different levels of understanding Photoshop or different levels of uh, understanding how to, compo to compose an image. 
So there is no video that can work for everybody. That's what I mean. They are all custom made according to each photographer's needs. Thank you so much, Theodore. A really, Hi, really inter interesting um, uh, talk, which I'm sure um, we've all enjoyed. Um, uh, and I really so enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you for being ever so kind to share your um, uh, works uh, with us. I remind everyone for next week, we're, we're going to have a webinar next week, another webinar, um, and we're going to have um, um, a video given to us by Damien McIllicuddy. And this will be, it's, it's going to be in two parts. We're going to share um, the first part. It's about studio lighting. And uh, there is also a part where um, Damien will be giving a critique on his uh, photograph, similarly like Theodore did today. So it will be yet another interesting webinar from um, an established uh, international photographer. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, thank you uh, I wish you all thank you. I wish you all a good week. Um, hope to see you next week and uh, keep safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All.